Luke chapter 15 and verses 11 through 24 reads as follows. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the young of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance, but rise his living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his field to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many high servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto my father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy high servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto his father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. But this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found, and he began to be merry. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, this morning, and today we want to speak to you on this subject, amen, uh, that the Lord has share with us to be shared today. A whole heaven but a human hell. A whole heaven but a human hell. Now, whole heaven is a phrase that is used to define and portray a state of being or existence. Uh, many of us have sometimes heard that saying. I don't know if the younger uh, members have heard it that much, but some of us that are uh, a little more mature often heard folks say they were in hall heaven in certain situations. Uh, but when we look at that term and understand what it means, we have to get a better understanding of what a hall heaven really is. Now, Colin Diff Dictionary defines hall heaven as a state of great ease or happiness. Uh, Dictionary.com defines hall heaven as a place of total bliss. Webster defines hog heaven as a very pleasing or satisfying state or situation. Uh, the Urban Dictionary says this about hog heaven. It said it is a filthy pig sty with plenty of fresh slop on which to feed. Now the phrase hog heaven is an oxymoron. In other words, it doesn't make sense to put the two words together. Hog and heaven. And think about it. You don't think about a situation where you want to put hog and heaven together. But it's strange that we find in this life, uh, we have linked those two terms together. But the thing is, there's nothing about a hog life that should be linked to heavenly living for a human. There's no hogs in hell. <laughs> there's no hogs in heaven. Hogs don't have a heaven in hell. The hogs won't be running around the streets of glory. They won't be saying hallelujah. None of them will be snorting and rolling in the streets of gold. There will be no hogs in heaven. So why we use the term hog heaven? But understand this about a hog. A hog life is one of pigging, rolling, rooting, snorting, squealing, and slaughtering. Hog is born to die. That's the way a hog is born to die. <laughs> he pigs around, he rolls around in the dirt, rolls around in the mud, roots around on the ground, makes holes everywhere, snorts around, squeals around when something is wrong, and then eventually he's slaughtered for food. We do know this, 
I don't know who has what they people have for dinner today, but a lot of us know we enjoy our pork chops with gravy. Now, I don't mess with pork chops like I used to. I kind of leave them alone. I know Reverend Young don't mess with them either. But every now and then, if somebody serves a pork chop, smothered pork chops, with rice and onions, y'all know where we're going. And it's all served with some greens and cornbread. All of us will enjoy a whole. A whole dietary regimen is slop. Slop is this. Slop is spoiled, leftover, outdated, perishable, that's not consumed by humans. None of us will eat slop. We'll throw away slop. But a pig will enjoy slop. Uh, I'm not saying this by what nobody told me. I'm saying this by what I know. I don't know if I presented it to you before, uh, but I actually had a hog, and my hog name was Sheila. And all Sheila would do was pig around, root around, <laughs> squeal, snort, and then what would she do? Eat slop. It's the funniest thing uh, when you think about what slop is. A hog spends all of their days confined in a hog pen waiting for slop. Confined in a hog pen eating slop. Confined in a hog pen fighting other pigs over slop. So you have to think about this. Is it logical for a human to believe that they can dwell and exist in a hog heaven? And think about it. Is it logical? It's senseless. It's unreasonable because of this. What is bliss to a hog is brutal to a human being. What is good to the hog is gross to the human. What is pleasing to the hog is punishing to the human. What is sweet to the hog is sickening to the human. And what is heaven to the hog is hell to a human being. I always remember the thing that was left over in my mouth's refrigerator, the thing that we couldn't eat. The thing that you would go to these old bread stores and they didn't want to serve the bread because you couldn't buy it no more. It got nowhere. It got molded. We would go and buy these. Or go, they didn't buy it. Just go pick it up. And, and you know what? We put it in. Reverend Young know what I'm talking about. This was the situation. Just like we had a refrigerator for our food, we had a refrigerator for the whole slot. The only difference was the refrigerator we had in our house was a refrigerator to keep it cool. The refrigerator we had out in the yard was hot to make everything simmer so it can get bad. So, so think about that. Whenever a person goes say they want to be in a hall of heaven, they're not thinking logically. They're not thinking with their good senses. Because no person in their right mind will want to abide in a place where a hall lives. Now Jesus utilizes this parable to paint a portrait and to codify and verify wise counsel. He uses it to unveil vital information. He uses it to announce what is allowed to activate our adjustment. He utilizes it as a, to demonstrate that there's a result of restored senses. And he also utilizes this parable to let us know there's a settlement that is secured by a sincere, I'm sorry. Notice, all of these things Jesus brings out in this parable. Now first Jesus points to a portrait of a, a young man and a young son who is guilty of what many children and young people are guilty of. He desires what his father has, but hasn't done anything to deserve it. So he wants what his father has, but he hasn't done anything to get it. He longs to hold what he hasn't lifted a finger to have. He wants to possess what he hasn't worked to procure. He's bent on wanting to go from his father that is giving him everything that he needs, but he's blind to what he's got with his father. Think about this. Here we have a young son going to his father, saying, Father, give me my inheritance. Now, inheritance usually doesn't go to a person until after the parent is gone. But now he's going to his dad and saying, I want what's mine. Notice what he says. He says, I want what is mine. The only reason he has it is because it belongs to his father. And so Jesus is trying to make a point here. He said, the only reason we have what we have is because our father has it. If our father doesn't give it to us, we don't have it, we can't use it. And first of all, and most of all, it don't belong to us. I'm thinking about the scene on Good Times. I know y'all are going to laugh on this. 
uh, had a character called Sweet Daddy Williams. And J.J. was going to do a show for Sweet Daddy Williams. And because J.J. was doing his painting for Sweet Daddy and doing all these things for Sweet Daddy's uh, main lady, he was going to give him a, a private showing where he could show all of his photographs and his paintings. And so Sweet Daddy gives all these things to J.J. He, he, he comes to the house because it just happens the refrigerator is not working and it's broken. And so he buys James and the family a brand new refrigerator. He, he buys J.J. a whole new wardrobe. He buys J.J. all the painting supplies and equipment and these was that he can use. But one thing happens. When Sweet Daddy's lady comes from out of town and she walks in with her fur and her brand new purse and all these things and she sees the photograph that J.J. has painted of her, but she is not pleased with it. And so that lets you know how quick the world can turn on you now. Sweet Daddy was giving him everything that he needed, everything that he wanted, but the moment his lady was not pleased, Sweet Daddy was not pleased. And so what Sweet Daddy did, Sweet Daddy said, well, he's not embarrassed by anybody. So Sweet Daddy proceeded to do this one thing. He told J.J. he had to give up everything that he had given to him. Notice. Everything he had given to him, now Sweet Daddy wants to take it back. And Sweet Daddy tells James, I'm breaking my refrigerator. I'm taking the TV set. I want to, I'm taking the easel. I'm taking the painting equipment. I'm taking everything that I've given you. And J.J. standing up there with all these pimping clothes on, pimping hats, and all these furs and stuff on. And he, Sweet Daddy proceeds to tell J.J. to give him back everything that he's given. He starts putting his head down. I want the hat and the glasses. The coat and the shirt. The shoes and the socks. Yeah. And so he's standing up there and he's saying, Mom, why do I have to give all this back? He said, it wasn't yours in the first place. And so he proceeds to go all the way, he said, and the pants. Yeah. And so J.J. is standing up there and has to take off the pants and, and give them to the Sweet Daddy. And Sweet Daddy walks out and says, well, I'll be coming back tomorrow for the refrigerator. And so when he leaves, his mom and dad says, well, son, we got some good news and some bad news. They said, well, what good news and bad news could I have out of this? He said, well, what do you want first? He said, well, give me the, 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 the bad news. He said, well, the bad news, you're not going to have your own private show. He said, well, okay, but what's the good news? He said, well, the good news is them could have been sweet daddies. Underwear. I'm not going to say what he's saying, but sweet daddy's underwear. Yeah. So, so you have to understand, the world will always give you things, but you don't keep what the world gives you. Sure when somebody gives you something that belongs to them, they have the right to take it back. Yeah. They have the right not to give it up to you also. Next thing we realize, Jesus provides a view that codifies and verifies the wise counsel of our patriarchs and matriarchs. Some of us remember them saying these things. You would hear them say, well, if you don't work for it, you will going to waste it. They say, if you get it fast, you're going to give it up fast. Yeah. They say, living fast and loose leads to famine and loss. They say, and notice what Jesus says in verse 13. He says, not many days after that, the younger son gathered up all that he had and journeyed into a distant country and there wasted his fortune in reckless and loose from restraint living. He had no sense of value for it because he didn't work for it. He didn't sweat for it. He didn't have to do anything for it. So since he didn't have to do anything for it, he didn't even have any problem throwing it away. It's funny. I remember my daddy would say this a lot of times. We would always ask for this and ask for that. And a lot of times, I said, Daddy, give me some gas money. He said, well, where are you going? Why are you riding up all this gas? Well, I'm giving you enough gas money to get to school and get back home. But dad, dad, you, you only give us a couple of dollars just back in the day when you can buy five gallons and five dollars of gas and get you about three gallons back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you give us a full tank? He said, you don't need a full tank. He said, the only thing that full tank is going to do is tempt you to go somewhere where you don't need to be going. Yeah. That's all it's going to do. All you need is enough to make it. As yeah. long as I'm giving you what you need to make it, that's it. Yeah. Said, but daddy, that ain't right. He said, well, it ain't about right. It's about what you need. All you need 
is enough gas to get to school and get back home. Yes. You don't need a full tank. Yes. If I give you a full tank, it's going to get used up. He said, I don't have a full tank. He said, the only thing that needs a full tank at all times is that bus that's out there making a, a living for us to put food on this table. Yes. Yes. Understand? And so after I grew and understood for myself, I understood there are things that I earn that even though they belong to me, I give them to my child. Yes. Because they belong to me. I have the option of giving it to my child. Yeah. It don't really belong to my child. She has it by caveat that because I have it, she can use it. Yeah. And that's the way it is, children, because when your parents have something, just because they have it don't mean it belongs to you. A lot of times we say, that's my TV, that's my refrigerator, these my clothes. But you see like this, well, when you buy your clothes, when you pay for your refrigerator, when you pay for the electricity, and your name show up on all the bills, yeah. then you can say it's yours. Yeah. And so we have to understand, this young man wanted something that didn't belong to him, but his father still went ahead and gave it to him. Yeah. Jesus also uses the parable as an opportunity to unveil vital information. First thing he does, he lets us know that the child who walks away ends up. Notice, the child who walks away ends up. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? The child that walks away ends up. Well, the child who walks away from the happiness and sustenance of the father's comforts ends up having to handle and suffer foreign circumstances. Notice, as long as you're at home with mom and daddy, whatever you want gets taken care of. But when you leave mom and daddy and you say you're going out on your own, guess what? You got to deal with things on your own. Those situations and circumstances that mom and daddy would take care of, now it's on you to take care of it. Now you're responsible for handling it yourself. The other thing he says, the child who walks away from the father's favor ends up in foreign famine. The, the one who walks away from his father's house ends up in a foreign hog pen. Uh, that word foreign means this. It means alien. It means distant. It means far off. It means strange. It means unfamiliar. It means unknown. You ever notice, and this is from experience too, whenever you leave mom and daddy's house and you say you're going out on your own and you, and you feel like you're grown and you find yourself in a situation that you didn't have to face before because mom and daddy took care of it. And so the minute you find yourself in that situation, these are the words that come to your, house, your mouth. I'm not used to that. I'm not familiar with that. I never had to deal with that before. Yeah, because mom and daddy been dealing with it for you. So be careful because once you go into foreign territory, foreign territory is not going to take care of you. It will take you out, but it will not take care of you. He then proceeded to let us know how the child who walks away from their wonderful father to go out after the world fun will wind up. Is what Jesus said this. And he lets us know this. And all of us need to understand this. The world will woo you. And young children, woo means lure you, attract you. Uh, for some of us that do some 80s song, can you woo, woo, woo? That means drawing somebody in. The, the world will, will, will oppress you. The world will rob you. The world will lessen you. The world will desert you. And after the world does this, the world will leave you wallowing, outlaying, regressing, longing, and dying. The world don't treat nobody good. Every one of these actors and singers who said they had nothing and they wanted to be on top of the world. Funny thing about being on top of the world, the world is spinning all the time. And if the world tilt the right way, you can fall off. And so that's the way the world works. And so we know what we're talking about in these situations is true because Jesus said this in the parable. And when he had spent all he had, a mighty famine came upon that country and he began to fall behind and be in war. So he went and forced and glued himself upon one of the citizens of the country. 
country who, 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 who allowed him and sent him into the fields to feed his hogs. And then he said he would gladly have fed on and filled his belly with the care pods that the hogs were eating, but they could not satisfy his hunger and nobody gave him anything. Notice, he went from being in all heaven to wind up in the hog pen. And there's one thing about hogs. When the hogs in the pen, they all for themselves. You're not going to find no hog step back and snort at the other hog and say, go ahead. Every hog is for himself. Whenever you take slop and put it in a trough, you will always see the hogs fighting and grunting. And what's going to happen, that little hog going to get pushed away from that trough. And the biggest hog hmm, go eat everything from the rest of the hog. The other one going to try to get near the trough. But you know what that big hog going to do? He going to turn around and bump him. He going to hit him with his head. He going to snort. He going to do all kinds of things. And you will see them squealing. But you will never see hogs stand to the side and let somebody else eat it don't work that way. Yeah. And so now he notices. He's going out into a world. A place called the hog heaven. And now he's suffering. He wanted to be a hog. But now that he's a hog, things ain't the way he thought it was going to be. Oh, yeah. Fourth thing Jesus does, he uses the parable to announce what the father allows in order to activate the young son's alteration. In other words, sometimes God allows things to come into our lives, allows things to occur to us so that we can make an adjustment, make a change, and make some correction. Hmm? Listen, sometimes God will allow things to come our way. He will step back so that there will be an adjustment, there will be an alteration, there will be a change, and there will be a correction. We see this in verse 17 where Jesus says, Then when he came, and notice, notice this now, and back up. He allowed his son to leave. The Bible says he gave him his portion. He didn't stop him from leaving. Notice, he didn't say, son, you need to stay. Son, there's a rough world out there. He gave him his portion and he let him go. And so, this is the thing sometimes family, parents have to do and that God does this too. Sometimes the father will allow the child who walks away from him to slop and wallow in the hog pen in order to shake up and wake up their senses. You hear me? Sometimes God will allow the child to have to deal with the slop, have to wallow in the mess so that they can get shook up and wake up. I know most of the young people in the heaven, but to have the aroma of fresh slop hit your nostrils has a waking up effect. And, 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 and you can't describe it. It's worse than that of a, a, a skunk. And it's worse than that of a bath. When you see and smell the aroma from slop, I guarantee you it will wake you up. If you are sleeping, it will shake you up. When you see what's roaming around in that slop, it will stir you up. And if you don't understand what's going on, if you get it on you, it will mess you up. <laughs> so God will allow the child to go through something so that he can see what it's like to be away from the father. In verse 17 he said, then he came to himself. He said, how many high servants of my father have enough food and even food to spare, but I am perishing, dying here of hunger. No matter how hungry you, hungry you are, no matter how hungry you are, none of us will be so hungry that we will open up a slop bin and eat slop. None of us will ever get that low where we'll open up a slop bin and eat slop. None of us would allow ourselves to be so low that we would go to a hog trough, a hog trough and eat what the hogs are eating. Because it's just that shocking. Fifth thing Jesus does. He reveals the result of regaining your senses. 
A lot of times we'll say that. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I had to come back to myself. Once I came back to myself, I didn't understand what was going on. And so, regaining of the senses results in two things. The first thing, the person will become apologetic. That means they will become remarkable and repentant. In other words, they will say, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. When a person is going through a hard pen and going through the hell of a hard pen, they will apologize. They will say, I'm sorry. The second thing that will happen, that person will become abased. Abased means this, they become humble, they become meek, they become respectful. And that's confirmed in verses 18 and 19. It said, the young son said this, I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your high servants. He wanted to go home so bad. He said, Daddy, I'll become a servant if I can't become your son. Because I was so foolish. I'm not worthy of being your son. I'm only worthy of being your servant. Finally, Jesus shares with us how a sincere, I'm sorry, seals secure settlement with the father and his child. You always notice all these commercials. Mars Bar. Garden McKernan. Dudley and DeBosia. Jim Callahan or whatever it is. Yes. All these attorneys are advertising. They want you to serve, but you do know what they do. They settle your case. Did you hear it? They say they settle your case. But in order to settle your case, you got to pay them something. But notice what God is saying. He settled the case, but we didn't have to pay it back. Do you hear me? He settled the case, and it didn't cost us anything. But anytime you're in the world and the world says they're going to settle something with you, it's going to cost you something. Usually it's going to cost you 30%, 33%, 40%, but it's going to cost you something. And so notice here, when you're dealing with the Father, when you're dealing with God, notice how God responds to a sincere, I'm sorry. In verses 20 through 24 it says this, So the young son got up, and came to his own father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity and tenderness for him. And notice what he said the father did. Before he got home, the father saw him coming. Before he can get to the house, the father met him on his way. That's what God does. Before you even get to God, God will meet you on the way to him. Then it says this, he ran and embraced him and kissed him fervently. Notice now, the father runs, grabs the son, embraces him, and kisses him. You live in a society where it used to be the world said, men are not supposed to embrace one another. Men are not supposed to hug one another. Men are not supposed to kiss one another. Not the way that the world is doing it. Do you hear me? But in an affectionate way, in a loving way where they are brothers and friends and fathers and sons. And notice what he said. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I no longer deserve to be recognized as the son of yours. But the father said to his son, he said this, he said, Listen, called out to the bond service. Bring quickly the best robe. The festive robe of honor. Put it on him. Give him a ring for his hand and sandals for his feet. Bring out the fatted calf and kill it. And let us revel and feast and be happy and make merry because this my son who was dead is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And he concludes by saying this and they began to revel and feast and make me there. Notice, he left home, he had shoes on his feet. He left home, he had clothes on his back. He left home, he had more than he can use, more than he can ask for. But on his way home, he came back with nothing. But when he got to his father's house, what did the Lord say? We get through with this old race and, and all of these things over the old folks say, I'm going to take off these old war clothes. Pull off my fighting clothes and pull off my sword. Notice what it said the father did. Called the service. Bring him a robe. Put his robe on. Then he says this. Put a ring on his 
his finger. A ring was a sign of honor. A ring was a sign of royalty. Put a ring on his finger. Show the people that that's my son. Put some shoes on his feet. He would bath with it, but he's not going to walk around here. Bath with it. Put some slippers on his feet. What them old folks used to say? When I get the glory, go put a crown on my head. Put on my long white robe. Put on my golden slippers. Walk around heaven all day. Hmm? But notice this. It said they began to revel and make merry. Whenever God's child comes to his senses, Whenever God's child realizes that there's no place like home. Whenever God's child realizes that my father does everything for me. Everything I have came from him. And nothing that I ever had would ever be taken from him because it belongs to him. And as long as it belongs to him, it belongs to me. What the old fool used to say? He owns the cattle on a thousand years. People say, you ain't got nothing. Oh, no, you don't understand. I have everything that I need because my father owns the cattle on a thousand years. And because it belongs to him, it belongs to me. And so as we close in this parable, Jesus presents and he proves some powerful points. First thing he does, he, he presents that it's a short trip from favor to famine. And it's a thin line between high life and hard life. You can be on your high heart right now, just like Paul would, and get knocked off of it. Hmm? You could be sitting high right now and you can fall low and it don't take but a twinkling of an eye. He presents that selfish and sinful and riotous living results in senselessness, separation, slopping and suffering. Whenever a person turns from the fall, do what the old fool used to say. When you do something foolish and you talk and say something that don't make sense, you'd have lost your mind. Yeah. You know and then they used to say that to make it to make it pointed and strong, you would have lost your natural bone mind. Yeah. <laughs> say, I don't know what you need, but you better come quick and get your senses quick yeah. before I knock some sense into you. Yeah. You notice? Yeah. That's how the old for you to talk. And notice how God is saying, when you come to your senses, He has a way of knocking you back into your senses. Yeah. God has a way of bringing you back into your senses. But when He does, he does it so that you can come back to Him. Oh, yeah. He does it so that you can have what you lost, have what you walked away from, have what you turned away from. Yeah. Yeah. He presents the shock of having to dine with swine can shake a person up and wake a person up. Once again, if you ever have to be involved with swine and slop, one thing it will do, it will wake you up. Oh, yeah. It will shake you up. It will turn your life around. He lets us know this. The journey from being senseless to having sense spurs a person to say and see that I'm sorry. In order for you to say I'm sorry, you have to see that you're sorry. If you don't see that you're sorry, you'll never confess to. If you always say I'm right, you will always be wrong. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Because only one person is right, and that is God. God is right in every situation. Man is never right in anything. The only time man becomes righteous is when he is in God. Y'all hear me, children? The only time a man becomes right and righteous is when he's in God. When he's separated from God, nothing that man does is right. Jesus proves that being sincerely sorry sets up and seals the settlement agreement between our father and his child. When a child recognizes and repents for the error, this is what happens. Our father lovingly receives his child back home. Our father lovingly restores his child back home. When you say, I'm sorry, and you realize that you were wrong, and you understand that you were in error, then your father will lovingly rejoice because he knows his child who is dead is alive again. His child who is lost is found. His child who has wandered away from his house is now back home with the Father. You understand why the song Amazing Grace is so wonderful? Why it captures so much? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Remember what the song is? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. He got this from the prodigal son. Once you realize that God is the best thing that ever happened to you, know what you say? I was a fool. Devil leave home. I was a fool. Devil walk away from God. I'd be a fool to turn my back on the one who's given me everything, who makes everything possible for me, who give me my breath, who give me my strength. I'm not a fool. I ain't turning away from God. Yeah. 
Don't leave your father's house looking for a hall heaven. For you only land in a human hell. You only land in a human hell. Yeah. There's nothing heavenly about being a hog in this world. Oh, yeah. And you have to understand one thing. This world is a hog pen. Yeah. Everything in this world is a hog pen. Think about it. You have to wallow in things. You're always having to find yourself dealing in slop all the time. You have to deal with mess all the time. You're dealing with smells and situations that just stink up the place all the time. You do find the stupid stuff all the time. And there's one thing I'm going to let y'all know. It's one other thing. If being a hog is so heavenly, why is that even hog going to break out the feet? Huh? You got to understand it. One thing about Sheila, no matter how much slop I fed her, no matter how much I was spraying the dirt so she can have a wallowing hole to wallow around in the mud, no matter how good we made it for her throwing husk and, 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 and bread and all the other things, no matter what we put in that pen, she would always root up the pen. Yeah. She would always tear up the pen. And one thing she would always do, she would always break out the pen. If hog heaven is so good, why is the hog trying to break out? It can't be the hardest cut up to be. Because if the hogs don't want to stay in the pen, it can't be that good. Yeah. And the funniest thing we always remember, we had to catch Sheila because Sheila, we came from church one Sunday, and Sheila was rolling around in the sugar cane field. And when we tried to get Sheila back in the pen, we grabbed her by the back legs and was dragging her back to the pen. And all Sheila did while we were dragging her was squeal the whole way back to the pen. Yeah. Because she had got out the pen and she didn't want to go back in the pen. Once you get out of the whole pen and you find yourself in a heavenly place, yeah. you don't want to go back. You squeal before you go. You fight to go back. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. That hog squealed and screamed so much because we tried to get her back in that pen. And the whole time, once we got her back in the pen, she took her head and kept trying to hit the side of the wall to break back out again. So if a hog <laughs> don't want to stay in the pen, if it's not heaven for the hog, why would we leave our father to go to a place that even the hogs don't want to be? Huh? A hog heaven, but a human hell. A hog heaven, but a human hell. But there's one place where we can all go. In my father's house, a many mansions. In my father's house, is everything I need. In my father's house, there's a tree that's good for the healing of a nation. In my father's house, there's joy, there's peace, there's all the things that I need. In my father's house, no, there's no more tears, no more pain, no more foolishness. No more situations. Yeah. No more hurt. No more backstabbing. No more having to worry about anything. In my father's house. Yeah. Is everything yeah. that I need. Yeah. 